Welcome to Vanadium Mysteries. Today's episode is dedicated to a, a mysterious material, actually, called Starlight. And it's uh, are a very sort of a famous slash infamous, no, not really infamous, but it's a brilliant creator, uh, Maurice Ward. So I first learned about this stuff when I was a little kid, and it first captivated me and sent me in the direction to study material science for, uh, for a career. And uh, so I first learned about this stuff in, in the early 80s. So what is Starlight? Um, what, what, who was this inventor, Maurice Ward, this hairdresser, who all of a sudden became the, you know, the scientist of, uh, of the hour, who everyone was looking at and everyone was wondering, how does he do this? What is this stuff? What is this Starlight? And as I was a, when I was a kid, this idea of what was it to be indestructible? Um, you think of Wolverine, adamantium, his claws are made out of this indestructible metal. What is it to be indestructible? What are the strong, what is it, what are the strongest materials out there? Is there something that's actually indestructible? And I really, these were questions that I had as a kid, and they set me off in the direction of studying material science and studying ceramics. So the strongest material in the world, it's kind of hard to define. You have to define what kind of strong you're talking about. So if you're going to define, uh, you know, in terms of just mechanical strength, like if you're going to pull on it, probably their carbon nanotubes are the strongest materials in the world. And the thinking was that eventually these carbon nanotubes, which are like diamonds, that if you took a diamond and stretched it out into like a rope, it's a, it's a molecular atomic structure, and stretched it out into a rope, all these carbons kind of link together perfectly, and you can make this really super strong nanoscale rope. And if you add, if you make, if you strand them together and weave them together the same way you do with textiles, you could develop a cable that you could put into something called a space elevator. And the idea was the carbon nanotubes, and there are some other materials out there. Spider silk is another one that's actually incredibly strong and tough and resilient. So there are a lot of these really special, some special natural materials in the animal kingdom. Um, you know, there are mu uh, mussels have this uh, glue that they use to stick to surfaces, and it's actually stronger than any of the glues that material science, material scientists can come up with, including myself. So, strength can be defined in terms of like how hard can you pull on it before it breaks apart. There's hardness. So you think of the hardest materials in the world. People have heard of diamonds, silk, and carbide. There's one that uh, that I've that I've had some success working with, and that's yttrium oxide which is this, uh, it actually looks, if you had a single crystal of it, it looks a lot like diamond. Very transparent, very beautiful crystal. Um, it mostly is found as a, as a white powder, but I've managed uh, to figure out some ways to put these, this material into a coating. And this is an extremely high temperature material, extremely hard, uh, extremely strong. Some of the other things that are out there, you know, diamond, zirconium oxide, zirconia, um, uh, and another one, that's, so I, I looked up some of the strongest materials that are out there, and one that came up the highest, so I was like, what's the highest melting material? And that could sometimes change. So the, right now, the highest melting material is something, uh, it's like a carbide, like silicon carbide as well, but it's actually hafnium tantalum carbide. And this is one of these new materials that, uh, that science has come up with. It's not something you'd find if you were digging up and digging up ores in the ground. But this stuff melts above 4,000 degrees Celsius. So this is, we're talking about maybe like a quarter to half the temperature of the surface of the sun. So you're getting to be where it's just unimaginable temperatures. Then there are materials that are incredibly strong for how little of it it takes and how thin they can be. So there you can take, there's a materials called silica aero, aerogels, which you can, you can make out of there essentially a foam, this mostly air with a little network of glass. And this glass is actually incredibly strong. And this material, you can, it's a foam that you can see through. And I've actually made this myself in the lab, and it's, it's really beautiful stuff. And I'm going to actually make some samples for the Vanadium audience, and I'm going to have a little giveaway. Because getting good aerogels is a little bit hard to, hard to do. So I'm going to make a, a, a giveaway that's going to be coming up for the Vanadium audience where I'm going to actually give away some homegrown Vanadium silica aerogels. So this brings me back to starlight. What is starlight? It was a material that came out, and it was a, a coating that you could put on everything, invented by a guy called Maurice Ward. 
And this guy had this insane demonstration where he would take an uncooked egg, put a little bit of this starlight coating over it, it looked like a little bit of a white kind of milky um, like nail polish that you put over a material. You put it over an egg and he hit the egg with a blowtorch. And the blowtorch, you know, caused a little bit of discoloration to the outside of the coating, but didn't actually even heat the egg up enough to coagulate or to basically cause a problem to the yolk. So the yolk was still liquid. So, you know, if you heat egg even up a little bit, that yolk starts to, starts to form a solid. So those proteins start to break down and that, uh, that tertiary structure, the protein breaks down, you get a, f a firming of the, uh, of the entire structure of the egg. And that's why you get that white stuff that forms and it gets, uh, it, viscosity goes up and the stuff doesn't flow anymore. Just a little bit of temperature does that. And this coating stopped it. And people even put it on their skin and hit their skin with blow torches without damaging the skin underneath. This stuff amazed me as a kid. And I thought to myself like, wow, this is real wizardry. I want to be a magician or an alchemist, but for real, I don't want to have to fool. I don't want to fool people. I want to make something that's indestructible. I want to figure out a way to be indestructible. Well, you can't really do that. That was sort of a childish notion. But I learned a lot over the years, and Maurice Ward was one of these guys who inspired me to become, uh, first, first and foremost, was somebody who just studied things, and then I became a scientist. And then after doing that for a while, then I really was able to start inventing things. And Maurice was able to really he didn't even really have to become a scientist to start making some real inventions. He was a hairdresser and made a, a perfectly good living as a hairdresser and by all accounts had a, had a happy, happy life and thriving business. And he, but he, ha he had this idea, starlight. And starlight, the material itself, is based on an idea that is, is completely real and it's actually, it does exist in fire retardant materials that are that are out there and it's been known since the ancient ancient Egypt really since the early days of pottery going back to you know ancient china so what it, what the basis for starlight is is something called an intumescent material so what an intumescent material is is something that when you apply heat to it it has to go through a series of transformations before it can actually catch on fire so this can mean that it has to change phase, it has to foam up, it has to char. So there are lots of things that have to happen before it actually catches fire and propagates a fire. And so that's, that may be a, a bit of a simplistic argument, but it's a way of dissipating the energy of something that's, of the heat that's incoming. And so these coatings actually are applied to a lot of uh, construction materials, a lot of construction steels will have a, um, an intumescent coating applied to the outside. And there are loads of, uh, of coating materials that do this. And I actually have some of my own uh, starlight recipes that I've, uh, I've implemented for um, people that I've worked for and you know, for, the, for, the, for the companies that I've worked for and, and helped in various applications. And I played a lot with over the years in my, um, in my academic labs and also in my, my home labs. So these are really interesting, cool materials. And, uh, so do, and, and they've been known to science for a long time. But Maurice Ward, kind of came up with his own brand of Starlight. And he marketed it and kept it a secret, kept the formulation a secret, and really didn't want any, any of it to get out. He was very protective of his technology. And that's where I think that, I, I don't want to say it was a mistake, but I think that inventors can, can sometimes hang on to their technologies a bit too tight. And it's, it's because of the business world and the way the business world functions. But the most important thing is to let technology get out there. That's the most important thing. And never to stand in the way. And Maurice had, did his share of fighting over the years. He had a lot of people saying his ideas were bunk. And no, it, it wasn't bunk. And the thing that he had going for him was the, were these demonstrations where he showed people what this coding, what Starlight could do with a blowtorch. And it blew people's minds. And, there was, and so the haters, they were out there. They're always going to be haters. They were trying to take Starlight and Maurice down. But this demonstration made that pretty difficult to do. Because people said, well, what about this? You know, he has a blowtorch on stage. He's not, not faking that. And back in the day, people didn't really fake anything. That'd be hard to fake today. 
But it was inconceivable that he was faking it. And he wasn't. And also, he was a, he's a good, good man with an honest reputation. But he really was a bit, I think, a, bit, a, l- a little bit worried that people were just going to steal everything from him and give him nothing. And that is something that has happened to inventors. It's a treacherous course. Being, um, be, well, I think when you're an inventor, you work in like a lot of artists in a corporate environment or business environment. So you're a, you're a fish out of water and you're trying, to, you're trying to breathe and you're trusting the business folks around you, to be honest, and not a lot of them always are. Well, a lot of them are. The vast majority of them are. They're, they're given a, an unfair bad rap overall, I, I believe. But there are some, some baddies out there. And Maurice, I think it, it hurt Starlight that he was so afraid of these guys stealing his inventions. Because he, sometimes you just, an idea... It's just mo- most important that it gets out there on the marketplace. And you'll, you'll get the credit that you're due. That's, that's, that's been my experience. But Maurice was one of my heroes. And he, it turned out that I, I remember seeing Maurice when I was a kid in these, uh, in these documentary clips uh, on TV. I don't even really remember. I'm going back so long. But it turned out that I met a man. Years later, when I was uh, almost 20 years old, and I was thinking about where I was going to go to college, and I lived right by Rutgers University in New Jersey, and there was a professor there in the ceramics department called Victor Greenhut, and he was, uh, you know, he'd been in the department for, for decades. He was one of the, he was a distinguished professor at Rutgers, and he did a demonstration with a space shuttle tile from the um, United States space, space missions, and he did the similar thing where he heated up... Uh, one side with a blowtorch and actually put the other side against his hand. And you could see half of the one side of the tile was red hot and the other side was touching his hand and it wasn't bothering him at all. It was cool to the touch. And that, you know, that sort of demonstration aspect of science, seeing something, that really, that's always something that, is, that did a lot for me then. It got me inspired. And it's something that I've, and I've tried to use the idea of a demonstration to, to, keep, to, to inspire and also to, to show people the potential of what, a new technology and new material can do. And I, that was what started me on my course. It's, I made the decision that day to, to go to Rutgers, and I made the decision to, to go into ceramics and material science, and I haven't regretted it. But Victor Greenhunt was one of these guys who was a, uh, I don't want to say, you know, mad, mad scientist isn't right, but a real true scientist, a true person who cared about discovery, a real intellectual, somebody who really just wanted answers and wanted to move the world forward to empower people to have more comfortable, happier lives with less pain and through, through technology, through science. And he had, I, I remember the one thing about him, I used to walk by his office a lot when I was at Rutgers. He had kind of a messy office. But he was, uh, his, when he would speak to you, he would have this just crystal clear, perfectly articulate way of delivering everything that he was saying. And even if he didn't know something, he was sort of articulate. And um, he was sort of almost poetic in the way that he explained not knowing it. So it, he, he sadly is, isn't with us anymore. Victor, uh, Dr. Green passed away in, in uh, 2016. 2016, what a great year, everybody. Anyway, 2016 um, was... So we lost Victor Greenhunt in 2016, and Rutgers lost a, a great professor. And I actually, he was involved in getting me my very first job when I was uh, 18 in the, in the laboratory. And, man, I, I, I miss him, and I was really sad to learn of his, his passing uh, a few years ago. So he, he taught me a lot about ceramics. He taught me a lot of stuff that has enabled me to earn a living. And he was a teacher who I never got a chance to tell him how much of a difference he made. So that's, he's one of the people that made me realize that I like to, if I get a chance, if someone did make a difference in my life, I like to, if I do have the chance to tell them, I want them to know. Is it a good boss? Is it somebody that, maybe it's somebody you didn't even know that well, that maybe you just had a conversation that really just sort of helped seal something up for you. There are these serendipitous events, these, these chance encounters with people that are just, they're destined to be, and they're important. And Victor Greenhut was one of these people. 
And it was interesting because the rumor was, is Victor Greenhut new Maurice Ward? And I, I, it makes sense to me that it almost makes sense that they'd be friends because I've seen video of Maurice and I, I, and I knew Dr. Greenhut a bit and they were both uh, true artists and scientists. Uh, just men that the best, the best thing, best things about being men, about people. The, the sense of discovery, the sense of always trying to be better. The, the, these were guys that weren't just all about chasing money. They were about really trying to do something, about trying to make their mark um, in the lives of, of everyone around them. And I want to dedicate this episode to, to Dr. Greenhut, who started me on my course, my course of study, you know, I think about all the time. And uh, I'm looking at his picture right now out of the corner of my eye. And it's, it's unfair that the pictures that I have to choose from don't really do the man justice. And I wish that I, I know there are better pictures of him. So it, it's kind of good that, you know, we're in an era now where everybody's taking a lot more pictures of themselves because you just never know. And you want to make sure you, you, there's something that captures the, the smile that you have on your face. And I remember uh, Dr. Greenhut always had a, or frequently had a very big smile on his face. And he, he wanted to talk to me when I was, when I knew nothing. And I had basically not, no ability to contribute. And he talked to me, sat with me in his office, and helped me with problems, and he helped me, helped guide me and get, get me a job, and helped advise me about uh, a direction to go into for, for grad school. Yeah, I miss Victor Greenhut. And he's an example of uh, an, what te- how important teachers can be. And the, the net effect of a teacher on the lives of the student, all the different students that they have over the decades and a good one can maybe create, you know, dozens of other good teachers who can inspire thousands, hundreds or thousands of other students to make contributions in their field or become teachers themselves who inspire others to make contributions in their fields. So these people, and, and Dr. Greenhut was a great researcher at Rutgers, you know, and people think of professors are researchers and teachers, but he was also a teacher. And even when he didn't need to, even when he had tenure, he cared about being a teacher. He was the best thing about being a professor. And he made me want to be a professor um, when I watched him do it. So thanks very much. This has been uh, Vanadium. What is Starlight? And this has been dedicated to uh, Dr. Victor Greenhut of uh, Rutgers University. Thank you very much. Stay safe.